Hello and welcome to all who are new here. Uh, welcome to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. For additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We are updating our uh, upcoming schedule frequently, so check back often. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the BOC, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation and assessment. The quiz will no longer pop up immediately after the webinar. You will have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. This email will come from customer care at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done in a timely fashion in order to receive your statement of credit. If you don't receive the follow-up email or you have any other concerns, then contact us via our new email address at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the question and we will, and I will review the, the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. And also, if you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left or to the right and the slides will become visible. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And then we will get started. All right. So my name is Dr. Michelle Henney. I work at Releve Sports Medicine. And today I'm going to be talking about platelet-rich plasma. In terms of our objectives, where we're going to be going to today, we're going to start first with the history. We're going to follow that with the physiology, which is the science and uh, sometimes the boring parts of things. We're going to follow that up with the meat of it here. And that's going to be the contraindications first, followed by the indications. After that, we're gonna talk about the clinic day process. From there, we're going through the equipment, then the rehabilitation, and finally, let's talk about the economics. So in terms of history, in the, in the 1970s, we were first seeing PRP utilized within the hematology world. And that was for patients who had thrombocytopenia, which refers to a low platelet count. After that, in the uh, 1980s, that's when we started to see the application of PRP fall outside of the hematology realm, initially going on in maxillofacial surgery as well as cardiac surgery. It was subsequent to that that we started first seeing the musculoskeletal applications in the uh, utilization of PRP. So why, why are people utilizing PRP? Well, they're utilizing as, as an adjunct to conservative treatment. There are certain circumstances potentially when rehabilitation alone or rehabilitation along with exercise has either been ineffective or intolerable, secondary to pain, or they're trying to avoid the morbidity, which is the essentially the side effects, the uh, dif difficulties in range of motion, uh, nerve injuries, the other, the other potential comorbidities that can occur uh, when surgical options are pursued. So what is it? And before we talk about what it is, we need to talk about all of the components of blood. So within blood, we have three main components here. And what we're looking at first, when someone takes your blood, what you see is, is a red to crimson colored liquid or fluid that's coming from your vein. And that is predominantly going to be colored secondary to the red blood cells. We know the red blood cells are involved with oxygen carrying and they provide the oxygen to the tissues from the lungs. There's also white blood cells and there's five types of white blood cells. The, the main type is the neutrophils. And we know that there are neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and those with the fills, they all have very heavy nuclei 
uh, which sometimes can impact their profile as once we get into the process of uh, uh, harvesting the blood and processing the blood. Uh, there's also lymphocytes as well as monocytes. So there's five different types of white blood cells here. And then finally, there's the platelets. So in this picture, when we're looking at the platelets, we're looking at those little light blue speckles throughout. And what is all these things sitting in? They're sitting in plasma. So plasma is essentially the water of the blood. And what is in the platelets that's so important? Why are we talking about this? Well, we have a lot of growth factors. You can see it turns into alphabet soup. So we're going to start from the top, that endothelial growth factor. It, the, the main things here when it comes to musculoskeletal applications is going to be that fibroblast mi migration and proliferation. This is involved with tendon healing, as well as the collagen synthesis. Insulin-like growth factor. This is involved with bone maintenance, the platelet-derived growth factor. Now you're getting back into those fibroblasts, also the mesenchymal stem cells. You have the osteoblasts here in terms of that chemoattractant effect. The TGF beta or transforming growth factor beta here is a mitogen for the fibroblasts, the osteoblasts, and smooth muscle cells. It helps to promote angiogenesis, which is uh, the development of vessels, as well as promoting extracellular matrix production. The vascular endothelial growth factor this is a powerful angiogenic growth factor. So again, involving with that vascular mediation. It's an important factor in wound healing, uh, thereby improving vascularity from the angiogenic effects, and then that endochondral ossification. So what has been demonstrated in terms of research as the impacts of some of these growth factors? And we're gonna start, first start with animal models. So in terms of the insulin-like growth factor, this was used in an equine model, so a horse model of flexor tendonitis. And what they found there was local soft tissue swelling was reduced, lesion size became smaller, cell prolifer pro proliferation and collagen content increased, and there was improved sonographic healing. In terms of the TGF beta, that demonstrated a dose-dependent increase in the expression of pro-collagen type 1 and type 3 mRNA. And this was correlated with a failure load and stiffness that were increased over a duration of time. And finally, in a mice model, what we were looking at here was the histology. And so that is taking the tissue and looking at it under a microscope to determine what are the impacts and this was utilizing PRP specifically. And they were seeing cell morphology, cellularity, vascularity, and collagen arrangement significantly improving in comparison with controls. Now, that is nice. We're seeing this in, in the animal models, but what did we see in human models? So in terms of in vitro human studies, what we saw was that using PRP formulations we were seeing that the chondrocytes, which those are the cartilage cells, with three different types of PRP or platelet-rich plasma, and those three types we were looking at were low concentrations of platelets, then we saw high concentrations of platelets, and then we saw the platelet poor. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and clarify some more. So that low concentration was actually referring to leukocytes. So there's low leukocytes, and there are high amounts of platelets with leukocytes, and then platelet poor. And so with those, we were seeing stimulated cartilage proliferation. Next, this particular study uh, coming from AJSM was looking at the synovium and cartilage being uh, put on a slide along with PRP or along with hyaluronic acid or visco supplementation. And in this circumstance, PRP was acting to decrease the cartilage catabolism, meaning that the cartilage breakdown, the rate was being decreased. We also saw decreased production of an inflammatory marker from the synoviocytes. 
Here's another article coming from AJSM, and that looked at PRP in the context of the interleukin-1 or IL-1. And so we know the interleukin-1 inhibits inflammatory effects. And what we saw was that after the PRP released its contents, and now you know what those contents are, that we were seeing diminished multiple inflammatory IL-1 mediated effects on those human osteoarthritic cartilage cells. It also inhibited a, a natural killer cell. And then in terms of a co-culture model, this looked at two different PRP formulations and looked at it in the setting of that human osteoarthritis cartilage and synovium. And in both settings, it had an anti-inflammatory effect. Therefore, they were looking at the low white blood cells and the high white blood cell concentration of PRP and looking at that in terms of gene expression. And they were seeing improvements in the inflammatory markers, although not all of them. So what are some of the contraindications for PRP? Well, absolutely, if someone has critical thrombocytopenia, PRP is not a good option for them. And why is that? Well, for one thing, if they have thrombocytopenia, they are going to have a decreased ability to stop bleeding. So in terms of your blood draw, in terms of accessing their vein to get their blood, they can have risk factors with that procedure. And then certainly in terms of the actual procedure of administering the PRP, whether it's to a tendon, a muscle, or a joint, there are risk factors there. Certainly if somebody is hemodynamically unstable, uh, this, this is not a good option. Uh, we're, we're not going around saving lives uh, with this PRP in a musculoskeletal content. Um, so, so if someone has a bloodstream infection um, or hemodynamic instability, it's not a good option. Again, if you're sticking a needle into something, you don't want to go into or through or around an area of an infection whether the septic arthritis in the joint, cellulitis of the skin overlying, or osteomyelitis where there's the infection within the bone nearby. At least at this point, I'm sure in the, the wound care world, they may start uh, coming out with more evidence in regards to those, but in the musculoskeletal world, let's stick away from that. And then certainly if those platelets are dysfunctional. So if we know that those platelets don't function well, then it would behoove us to not utilize a concentration of dysfunctional platelets. Now, what about relative contraindications? And one of the first things that you may have heard about, and it's very appropriate, is in regards to anti-inflammatories. And so at this point, the consensus is that you want to stop anti-inflammatories within one to two weeks prior to the procedure. And why is that? Well, here is a nice study coming out of AGSM, and this refers to the impacts of a 14-day dose of aspirin on those growth factors that we were talking about. And what we were seeing is that the expression of those growth factors is reduced when we are utilizing aspirin, which is a known anti-inflammatory. And interestingly enough, there was an even more applicable study for us, and that was on naproxen. Naproxen use, what was looked at in terms of the biological factors of PRP. And this, this is a, a really interesting study it came out of our, the Journal of Arthroscopy. And what they found is that with a one week washout period, they found that those growth factor levels did return to baseline. So there is, you certainly want to discontinue anti-inflammatories at a minimum of one week before, and some even will say up to two weeks before. What else? Well, if someone has had a recent corticosteroid injection, uh, and this, this can be of the knee, but it, it really, it's referencing a corticosteroid injection of the area of importance. So regardless of that anatomic location, if this person has had a recent corticosteroid injection due to those effects on the platelets that you're going to be putting into the area, you do want to allow that corticosteroid, which is very potently concentrated, to not be present in the same area as where you're putting PRP. And then the systemic corticosteroid use, that gets back to the same as point number one. 
finally, if anyone's had a recent fever or illness, that's going to be a relative contraindication. You do certainly want to talk about risks and benefit. Cancer-wise, now this one particularly, and I, I have had some people come and talk about, I have a history of a, a bone or a blood cancer in particular, a blood cancer, a leukemia, lymphoma. Uh, and, and what you want to be very, very considerate of and, and even consider having the hematologist or their oncologist or cancer doctor or their blood involved is, is taking that blood from inside their veins and now you're gonna concentrate it and put it into another area and you certainly don't want to have uh, any sort of metastatic or, or secondary sites that, that are secondary to a, a, a procedure like PRP. Anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, we've talked about that, um, as well as there is some uh, early evidence coming out in regards to pseudogout which is calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. And in regards to that, what we're seeing is with those calcium pyrophosphate crystals, even if someone has never had a outbreak or an attack, a pseudogout attack, which is, which is in some ways a misnomer, right? Because it's a different type of crystal than gout. But if they haven't, even if they haven't had an attack, if they do have those calcium pyrophosphate crystals within their joint space, for example, and you do have the ability to take that fluid and analyze that fluid, it would be a consideration because certainly if you can avoid uh, inducing a pseudogout attack uh, after a, a PRP injection, you, you would like to avoid uh, that. So then what are the indications, right? And that's, that's certainly a, a, a topic of ongoing discussion. We are continuing to learn uh, more and more, but let's start off first with knee osteoarthritis. Now, in terms of knee osteoarthritis, we really have the absolute most, the abundance of evidence is in the realm of knee osteoarthritis. And this one I'm gonna start with is a systematic review uh, coming out of the Journal of Arthroscopy. And what they found was that in comparison to hyaluronic acid, which is viscose supplementation or placebo, we were seeing significant improvements at two months and they were maintained up to 12 months. And then when they did a meta-analysis, this was looking at the 12-month mark. At that mark, we were seeing the, the minimum clinically important difference was exceeded. And that's really a, a hard thing to obtain. And we were, we were finding that in comparison with hyaluronic acid. So we said, okay, well, PRP seems to be better than HA in the setting of arthritis. What else? Well, we found that, that there's some evidence here that PRP potentially in combination with hyaluronic acid was more likely to reduce knee pain than PRP alone. Interesting. Okay. And then there was a meta-analysis done. And they said, okay, in overweight or obese patients, PRP is a better treatment option than hyaluronic acid. Now, finally, one... This, this journal coming again out of AGSM in 2020, so a very recent study, looking back to that leukocyte, the leukocyte numbers within PRP, and that's something that we're continuing to look at, is leukocyte poor, leukocyte rich uh, in terms of PRP. And in this systematic review and meta-analysis, what they found is that leukocyte poor may be superior in terms of knee osteoarthritis over leukocyte rich. So let's get into to some of these uh, concerns that our athletes may be coming in with. And as you remember from last week, if you were able to see last week's talk by Dr. Dugas of the Andrew Sports Medicine Institute, the partial proximal tear of the ulnar collateral ligament, at this point in time, there's a consensus in regards to utilizing PRP specifically with that indication. Certainly not if someone is having a complete tear and, and this really isn't a good option in a distal tear. But in terms of that partial proximal UCL tear, uh, what I'm starting off with here, this is a prospective case series. It was looking at 34 athletes, and these people had already failed two months of non-operative treatment. And so they utilized PRP, and what they found was that 88% of them were able to return to the same level of play without complaints. And that average time taken to return was 12 weeks. All right, what else do we know about PRP with, with these proximal tears? Well, we looked at a, an MRI correlation. And again, so we're, we've got 25 athletes here. This is a prospective study. 
and 23 are baseball, two are softball. And in this, they did PRP along with guided rehab. There were three athletes that failed uh, the, the PRP protocol, and two of those three had had previous surgery. Now, they also looked at MRIs after. We don't frequently get MRIs when people are doing well. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to get insurance to approve MRIs when people are doing poorly, but certainly when, MRI, you know, when they're doing well, it's, it's nearly impossible. Uh, so, so anyhow, so they did in this process, they did get MRIs afterwards and they were demonstrating stability of the UCL after treatment. And, and what do we know? We know that PRP is safe and effective. It's, it's it, in most circumstances, it's, it's coming from your blood and we were seeing this as the outcomes here. So at this point, I would say that it's a consensus that the PRP is utilized in the partial proximal. But like Dr. Dugas said last week, the, the big thing comes also down to timing. You want to have an athlete have at least three months so that you can do the six weeks of the post-procedure rehabilitation, followed by a six-week interval throwing program. And then certainly if they feel that, then you're talking about either UCL reconstruction or repair. So next we're gonna get into the partial or the interstitial supraspinatus tears. And so this first study uh, coming from the orthopedic traumatology surgery uh, journal here is a prospective case series looking at 25 patients. And what they did was they infiltrated uh, PRP into supraspinatus interstitial rotator cuff tears. And what they found was that they had a st statistically significant improvement in terms of their pain as well as their outcomes in, in the tear volume. They saw a decreased size of the tear volume in, in a statistically significant amount of those patients. So we say, okay, well, very interesting. That was in 2016. What else have we learned since then? Well, they looked at another study here, and this was a double-blinded randomized controlled trial. And this was in adults, and they were looking at, again, the interstitial supraspinatus tears. And at that seven-month time period, they were not able to find statistically significant difference between the PRP as, as in comparison with the control groups. And what else did they find? They found that the tendon healing as well as their clinical scores, they, they didn't see statistically significant differences here. Hmm. Okay, so we're seeing contradictory evidence. Um, and this one certainly a randomized controlled trial that's a, that's a good study to be following. Well, let's look at it from the high level view. So here we are, we're looking at a systematic review and a meta-analysis with a bias assessment, a total of eight level one studies were included. And what did we find? Well, there was a lot of heterogeneity, meaning that the studies were done very differently. There were, in terms of the funnel plot that they were looking at, it was asymmetric. So there was some, some possible publication bias that they were seeing. And we really want to keep in consideration, especially historically, um, the, the results and how to interpret those results. Now, granted, they did see that PRP may reduce pain associated with rotator cuff injuries. But if we look, and, and this is an AGSM article of 2018 and um, put out by Dr. Chen, well, let's see, this group actually put out a very similar study and let's look at that. So this one came out more recently in 2019. They, what they did is they got a more robust uh, volume of evidence instead of eight. Now we're looking at 18 level one studies and they did a pretty much the same report, but now with more information because there is so much more information coming out all the time. Again, the systematic review and meta-analysis with the bias assessment. And here we, they, were, they were looking again at leukocyte rich as well as leukocyte poor PRP. And what did they find? They found that the long-term retail rates were significantly decreased in patients with rotator cuff related abnormalities who received PRP. There were significant improvements in PRP-treated patients uh, for multiple functional outcomes. Now, none met that respective minimal clinically important difference. And that is something I will say this, that is something very difficult to achieve. And so overall, they may positively affect clinical outcomes. But at this point in time, there is still 
Even with 18 level one studies, there is still limited data, there's study heterogeneity, and poor methodological quality, which allows you to compare and contrast all of these studies that are being published. So that one's still in progress. How about hamstrings? So PRP, in terms of the treatment of hamstring injuries, what we're looking at here is a randomized controlled trial. This was a, a single PRP for grade two, because um, as we know that this is an area where we could potentially impact them, the grade one tends to get better fairly quickly. And in these groups, they compared PRP uh, to a control group, which was essentially a rehabilitation program alone. So PRP plus rehab, compared with rehab alone. And when they compared the two, what they found was the average number of days for a return to play were different. However, the overlap, there was an overlap, 42.5 days plus or minus 20.6. Well, so what you're saying is some of those people in the rehab alone group actually got better in hypothetically 22 days. So there was no statistically significant difference seen in that score found between the two groups. Okay, well, what else do we know? Well, since that time, this study came out this year in AGSM. It was a systematic review with the meta-analysis with best and worst case analysis, uh, analyses. And again, this looked at PRP plus physical therapy in comparison to physical therapy alone. And they were looking at the random effects model as well as the fixed effects models. And what we're finding is that further studies at this point of high quality with large cohorts do need to be performed to better support or disprove the consensus. And what, what was that consensus? That there was statistically non-significant evidence to suggest that there was a reduced mean time to return to player re-injury. So what they're saying is, is, is maybe, it's, maybe it's beneficial, but we really need more data. Next, we're gonna talk about lateral epicondylitis. And in regards to the lateral epicondyl, what we have here is a systematic review coming from the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. It's a systematic review of meta-analyses. And what they found was that in the treatment of lateral epicondylitis, which is really common extensor tendinopathy, that the autologous blood, which is taking your blood, pulling it out of your vein and immediately uh, injecting it. And if I will tell you this, that is a very, very painful procedure to occur. Um, but autologous blood and PRP both significantly improve pain and elbow function in a, in a longer term time period as compared with corticosteroids. And so that, if you're talking to your athlete about corticosteroids, they're frequently going to feel that pain relief based on this information for the short term, improved pain and function for the short term. Um, but in the long term, the, the negative consequences of corticosteroids in, in regards to cartilage wear in, in joint spaces or, or tendon uh, weakening or tendon rupture are, are higher in the longer term with corticosteroids. And, and so the autologous blood, which is a painful procedure and PRP are more effective when we're talking about a longer term time period. What about plantar fasciitis? Well, a systematic review here was done um, out of, again, the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine, and they were looking at uh, randomized controlled trials comparing PRP with corticosteroids. And in these, at the three-month and the six-month time periods, PRP was found to supply or provide better pain relief in comparison. Are there any other studies? Well, we've got a systematic review and meta-analysis here. And this one uh, was looking at some prospective trials. And what they found again, uh, in, and this was published very recently in the Journal of Orthopedics, was that PRP provided better pain relief compared to corticosteroids in patients with plantar fasciitis. And, and again, we, we, we know that there are uh, detrimental effects to corticosteroids. Um, and so this, this can certainly provide a better option for these, for these folks. How about the, the trochanteric bursitis, which we have 
uh, appropriate now renamed to greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And frequently what we are, have actually found is there's underlying gluteus medius tendinopathy. Well, this is a randomized controlled trial uh, coming from the American Journal of Sports Medicine again from last year. And what they looked at is these, these were in the realm, they were older, older people. Um, none of these folks had full thickness tears and they had all had symptoms for greater than 15 months. And they all received a single intratendinous PRP injection done under ultrasound guidance. And so what they found was that they had greater improvement and more prolonged improvement when they had the PRP injection compared to corticosteroid injections. So those corticosteroid injections um, maximized at six weeks as being, as at that point being better than PRP. But after that point, the PRP far outweighed the corticosteroid injection in terms of the results. What about patellar tendinopathy? Well, in terms of patellar tendinopathy, there was a randomized controlled trial done. And these folks had patellar, patellar tendinopathy on exam, as well as their MRI, and they failed non-operative treatment. So they had already undergone non-operative treatment at this point. And these folks, they underwent dry needling alone, or they did dry needling, excuse me, they did PRP along with the eccentric exercises, which is our typical mainstay with tendinopathy. Now, what they found was that that PRP group did have, uh, in, they improved significantly compared with the dry needling group at the 12 week mark. The, the difference between these groups, and they both received treatment, which does make this a difficult study to interpret, but the difference between these groups did not appear to be significant in the longer term time period. So at this point, what we're, what we're able to say based on this study is that the PRP injection does seem to help in the short term in terms of getting that athlete back to activity, but it does seem to dissipate over time in terms of those beneficial effects as it compares with beneficial effects from dry needling. So that it's not in comparison with a placebo. This is in comparison with dry needling, which is a treatment. So, so again, a little bit challenging to interpret this study. Now, what is the clinic procedure day like, right? And these athletes, they may come to you and say, uh, you're my athletic trainer. You're the person that I know best, that, that knows the most about healthcare. What is this going to be like? I'm, I'm scared and I'm worried and I'm about to go in. And what you can tell them now is that it, there's, there's nothing to be afraid of, uh, certainly. Uh, this is going to be just like getting your blood drawn. So you do want to make sure that if, if you're involved with the athlete and they are coming to you or, or you know that they're going to be undergoing this treatment, make sure that they're coming in well hydrated. It, it makes it much more, I, I always tell people the hardest part of this procedure, honestly, is the blood draw. We want to get enough blood in order to be able to process it and harvest it. We, and, and we don't want that part to be challenging. The, um, and, and what else is it? It's, it is a point of care blood product. So, so you're going to have your blood drawn. You're going to come into the office very well hydrated. You're going to have your blood drawn. And then that blood is going to be processed, meaning that it's your blood. It's nobody else's blood. Your blood is going to leave the exam room and it's going to be processed by centrifugation, which is a fast spinning machine. And after that fast spinning machine, and we're going to talk about the two different types of processes that that can undergo, then that medication or excuse me, that treatment is going to be brought back into the exam room and then utilized within the area of intent for that day. So what are those different types of techniques and equipment involved? At this point, there are two main types essentially in healthcare. One of them is the Buffy Coat system. And I really like this picture. It comes from the Journal of Arthroscopy. We're actually going to go through his, um, Dr. Anz's article here shortly. But he's got a really nice picture. The first one's a blood sample. You've seen that one before. And what this is, is it's a single long spin. 
And that single long spin separates it out and into a buffy coat layer. And that buffy coat layer is the circled lightish, light yellow layer that's in between. And what we can see in the diagram on the right that is that the platelets are concentrated there. Now you can see that the platelets extend up into a predominantly plasma layer. They also extend down into the red blood cell layer. So, so we don't get all of the platelets into one spot. It does tend to be throughout, but most concentrated at that buffy coat. Now, when you take that buffy coat, one of the things that you know is that you are going to be taking a little, uh, an amount of red blood cells. Why? Well, because you're trying to concentrate the most amount of platelets into your, uh, into your treatment here. And when, when you're trying to maximize that, you do have to get a little bit into that red blood cell layer. And we know from the autologous blood uh, that, that red blood cells are very irritating and inflammatory. So th this is one of the options and you try to minimize the amount of red blood cells as much as possible. What is the other option? The other option on the market here is the plasma-based system. So again, you start with the same blood and this one either goes through a, sh a single shorter spin or multiple spins. And, and what you're doing here, you can see is that this, this other spin concentrates the red blood cells and, and it does concentrate some of those white blood cells. There, are, I will say that there are some physicians out there that talk about the white blood cell profile, um, saying that those fills that we talked about, the eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils are heavy. They have very large nuclei in them. They tend to fall down um, into the red blood cell layer. And then you can either utilize the plasma layer here, or you can re-spin the plasma layer, concentrate the platelets with some of those smaller anti-inflammatory white blood cells and utilize that. So can patients modulate their PRP product by activity? These athletes may come to you and they may say, is there anything I can do to, to help to optimize the quality of the PRP that's utilized for my procedure? And you can tell them yes. So what we have found here is that with exercise, exercise does increase the number of platelets. And in this study uh, coming out of the Journal of Arthroscopy, this is, this is the study that uh, I, I have been utilizing those nice pictures from uh, of the PRP. Uh, this study looked at 20 minutes of vigorous exercise. So I have an athlete here who is who appears to be vigorously exercising. They are uh, nice and sweaty and they are now ready. They've improved their platelet concentration and they are ready now to have their blood drawn for their PRP process. Well, that sounds nice. And, and it requires either they're exercising before their appointment or they're exercising potentially at their appointment just prior to the blood draw. Is there any other ways? Well, interestingly enough, we've got another one here, high intensity interval exercise. And, and I, I chose this picture because this person is, is much less sweaty. This took a four minute period of high intensity interval exercise and they were also in, able to increase that total platelet count as well as their uh, transforming growth factor beta concentration. So is there a thought and, and you know, there is there a thought that we can have our, ex our athletes exercise prior to their appointments in order to increase that concentration of platelets uh, within, their, within their product? And that's something that, that's, that would be an interesting thing to, to continue to follow. What about rehab protocols? So this is a really good study. It, it just came out um, about the post-procedure protocols following PRP for tendinopathy specifically. And it was a systematic review done. And what we've found is that many times weight-bearing restrictions were not mentioned. However, the weight-bearing restrictions are more frequently mentioned when we come to weight bearing tendons. So things, areas like the Achilles tendon, like the patellar tendon, these are the more common areas where you talk about weight bearing restrictions. You're certainly 
uh, going to have less weight bearing restrictions on a non weight bearing tendon. So, so it makes sense that it was rarely um, discussed. Uh, now, the majority of protocols did institute stretching and strengthening. And where they found the stretching, the stretching and the mobilization typically began somewhere around that two to seven days following injection. And if you've taken care of any of uh, your athletes or, or you know someone who's gone through PRP, oftentimes in those first couple of days, they may be quite sore. And so, so they're often not initiating that program right away, but more often waiting a couple of days for that for that really robust inflammatory reaction that has been induced to, to calm down. And then they are initiating that strengthening program around the two to three week mark. Return to play or full activity uh, in regards to the systematic review was seen around that four to six week mark. And, and we know getting back to the, the UCL, for example, in that one, it's a six week of of rehabilitation followed by a six week interval throwing program. What else do we know here is that at this point, there is some consensus. However, there's not a lot of rationale that, that is supporting it. And we don't know yet what is the perfect post PRP protocol. And as we start treating more and more areas, my expectation is that the PRP protocols for each area is going to be slightly different. And we don't know yet, but we suspect that the protocol may actually affect the outcome. There's no studies directly comparing these protocols and the protocols that were reviewed had a lot of differences from one to the next. So let's talk about the economics. Because it really is important to talk about cost. And, and in this study, what we looked at is what is the appropriate price for PRP injections? Now, this study is specific to knee osteoarthritis. I will say the ro most robust amount of evidence comes from knee osteoarthritis. And what this study did is it compared cost utility scores. So you had the utility scores from baseline to six months and one year after saline in comparison with HA in comparison with PRP. And what they were looking at is the change in the utility score and they were comparing that to the total cost. And what, and what they were looking to determine is when is PRP going to be cost effective relative to other injection options? And so what they found is that for a cost effectiveness in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis, it would need to be less than $1,200 for a six month time period and $3,700 for a 12 month time period. Now this does include those clinic visits, those procedures, as well as the, in, the injection, the treatment. And we say, okay, well, what is the current price now for PRP? And, and what this study does is, is it looks at it's a prospective cross-sectional trial and it called, it called approximately 300 centers across the United States that advertised offering PRP injections for the treatment of knee osteoarthritis. And they were able to get a hold of 179 of these and they were able to, you know, they simulated uh, this patient who had knee osteoarthritis and they asked how much was it going to cost. And the mean price that they found for a single one side knee injection for that same day was $714. And there was a standard deviation there. So that gives us good information when we, as we start hearing about what the costs are, and we also consider in the setting of knee osteoarthritis, what that utility score is. Now I am gonna po point out this picture on the right. And this is a picture that's in regards to May of 2020 and journal club participants uh, that have attended the Releve Sports Medicine Journal Club. And, and they've been from across the United States, certainly a lot in Florida um, where, where I'm located, um, but also Texas, California, those are, those are big ones. Now, if you have any friends in Alaska, please feel free to invite them to our next one. <laughs> and let's talk about insurance coverage. So in terms of insurance coverage, there is a, a commercial plan now, TRICARE. TRICARE is the military 
uh, based insurance and they do cover PRP. They are specific about the indications for which they cover PRP. And those are mild to moderate chronic osteoarthritis of the knee, as well as tennis elbow. And this has been going on already since October of last year, and it'll be extending for the next five years. And what they frequently do, what TRICARE frequently does, is it initiates first a provisional coverage program. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are on their provisional coverage list, and this is just one of them. And what they look at is to see those over that five-year time period, what are the outcomes? I do suspect, my, my suspicion is that uh, if they are, are demonstrating in certain circumstances that they're getting better outcomes, they're able to uh, uh, prolong or, or delay the need for surgery and thereby the insurance uh, kind of saves money on that, then they're going to have that information more available. And then Medicare, my, my suspicion is that Medicare is gonna be just following along this data to be able to say, okay, is Medicare going to approve it or not? Because frequently what happens in the insurance world is once Medicare starts to approve things, then all of the other commercial plans uh, follow along. Otherwise, in terms of insurance coverage, I, I'm, I'm familiar with AG administrators through a couple of the universities, um, but there are other secondary claim insurances uh, that, that will cover it. So I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, if you are interested in being involved in other educational opportunities, you can head to our website. Our next webinar I'm really excited about, and that's going to be next Tuesday. And, and this isn't quite correct. It's next Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And that's Do Health Disparities Exist in Musculoskeletal Care? And we'll have Dr. Cleo Stafford um, from Emory University talking about that. Um, which is which is certainly very relevant right now, and we do want to know what those healthcare statistics are, so that we can best uh, advocate for our our athletes and our patients. So with that, I would like to now take questions. So ah, I already have a, a bunch of questions here. So I will be moderating for myself today. I'm going to just. Uh, make this window very large, and then I will get started on answering as many questions as possible before we run out of time. Okay, yes, the PowerPoint slides will be available after the webinar uh, in that the video, the videos are available on our website um, to, to be able to review again, or if you want to send it out to, you know, some, someone you know is going to have a PRP procedure, you can send it out. Okay. Ah, this is an interesting one. Could someone born with a low platelet count be able to increase their platelet count over time? And I, I do get that question a lot. Uh, the, the biggest things we know is that if they have different types of vitamin and mineral deficiencies that is a cause of a low platelet count, then you, you can, by supplementing back to the normal range, those uh, vitamin and vitamin deficiencies, you can help to improve their platelet count. There are some folks out there that are trying to uh, sell different supplements and things for in general improving uh, platelet numbers. And realistically at this point, unless you have a known deficiency, then those aren't necessarily going to be effective. Uh, okay, so let's see. Does the amount of blood drawn and the amount of PRP injected is that dependent on other factors such as patient size, injury location, et cetera? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And so, so what frequently with a lot of the different types of PRP uh, machines, you can moderate the amount of PRP that you're forming. And, and depending upon the joint, how much the joint is able to accommodate, a knee joint is going to be able to accommodate a lot more than the supraspinatus tendon, for example, or the common extensor tendon. The, the tendons, they really are, when you put a needle into that area, it's the, the tendons, they don't necessarily accommodate the space that is going to be occupied by, let's say, may, maybe in a knee, you might put in five cc's. 
Well, five cc's is a fairly large amount and the, and the tendon is going to really be angry and barking at you if, if, you're, if you put five cc's in, into a tendon that otherwise can't um, expand for that volume. So, so yes, I will say that based on the injury location, it is very reasonable to mod modify the amount of um, volume of PRP that you're using. The, and now in terms of patient size, patient size really um, makes, makes no difference um, in regards to the amount of blood drawn or the amount of PRP injected. Uh, patient size is going to be most impactful in terms of the blood draw because the blood draw can be more challenging if you're not able to find the veins. Um, and, and so you may need to come up with more unique ways to find the veins in those settings or uh, and the process of the procedure. So if, if someone is more obese, uh, then you may need to use something like a longer needle, for example, to be able to get to that injury location. Okay, so there's a question here about the uh, ideal types of modalities in those first few days, in that first one to five days, cold, hot, compression. Good question, good question there. So, so at this point, I will say, what, what, do, we, what do we know based on evidence? We, we really, we don't know a whole lot. Um, in terms of which modality is going to be most effective. So in that time period, particularly if someone has had a, a tendon, a muscle addressed more so than a joint, they are um, going to have pain due to that. And so I, I, would, I would personally go towards the cold. Um, you can absolutely do compression. I, I tend to uh, immobilize them or, or at least put them in a sling or, or if I'm doing the patellar tendon, I'll, I'll put them into a knee immobilizer. Um, so, so that's been my approach, but there, there, there really isn't much evidence. So, so cold heat, you, you can try it and see how they feel and, and see how they respond. Would cryotherapy be contraindicated um, in regards to that full inflammatory response? Again, we, we don't know. The, the evidence isn't out there yet. It, it is very, it is very reasonable. It is a very reasonable consideration that we are instigating an inflammatory response, and we want to allow as much of that inflammatory response to occur as possible. And so, there, intuitively, we may think that anything that is anti-inflammatory may may impact that robust response that we are looking for. So it may be reasonable to avoid that. And I, I didn't necessarily mention the, the anti-inflammatories after the procedure as well from a, from a medication standpoint, the, the naproxen, the Aleve, the Meloxicam, uh, the Diclofenac, whatever, um, you, you do tend to avoid those uh, medications as well for that, for that next four week time period is, is the consensus at this point. Okay. And okay, so it looks like so someone someone's asking about costs. I I believe at this point we have covered it. How much does it cost for this treatment? The the average being that seven hundred and fourteen dollars. You can talk to each the your your respective your local clinic to see what they're specifically charging for it. Um, and they ask if insurance does not cover it. Yeah. So uh, at this point, Tricare um, being the main one, then those secondary claim insurances uh, being the main ones that are covering it. Uh, and so there's a there's a question here about a history of anemia, um, and so so it's kind of taking a clinical situation. If you've had a history of anemia, maybe maybe you have an athlete and they've had a history of anemia, they have had an iron infusion, they take supplemental iron. If their hemoglobin level came up above 10, would PRP be a potential option in in that circumstance? And, and what I would say is in that circumstance, the, the physician would, if it were me, I would want to have a discussion uh, with the hematologist. Why? Because uh, if, if someone has had, whether it's a blood transfusion, now you have other, um, other people's uh, platelets uh, circulating in the blood. Um, it does change the physiologic factors of the blood. Um, and even so, even also with the iron transfusion, 
So, so that should be a, a, a discussion going on with, with both the physician that's doing the PRP treatment as well as the hematologist to, to determine what would be the best scenario for the, for the person. Okay, do any of the studies look at the differences in males versus females in terms of PRP amounts and then the quality of the draw? That would be a really interesting study. We, at this point, we don't have that information. What, what do we know? We know when we look at blood counts, when we look at CBCs, we know that the iron and the hemoglobin levels and rates, they're different. The standard levels are different in comparison from males to females. Um, and that, I mean, women uh, frequently bleed once a month. Um, and so, so uh, there, there are some, some physiologic factors that can impact um, the, the hemoglobin levels. However, we do not at this point have a, or know of a difference between males and females in regards to the platelet amounts. Uh, when, when we look at the blood counts, we look at uh, 150 to 400 is, is typically the reference range, the standard amounts. And so you're ideally trying to concentrate that to at least two and a half times what your baseline is. Is PRP being applied in pediatric orthopedics? It, it is. It is. I will say that the circumstances for which PRP being utilized in pediatrics are going to be much less. Um, they, if they're not, they're not as often injuring their uh, tendons, their muscles, um, and and they certainly don't have as frequently osteoarthritis. Or, well, they, yeah, not as frequently osteoarthritis. They may have something like JIA um, or a different type of arthritis. Uh, so, so it is it is being applied, um, but the rates are less uh, and. But you know, I mean, we still we all we all see it. These these kids are, are doing a lot of activity and, and injuring things like their UCL um, at younger ages. So uh, the answer to that is yes. How about weight bearing status for plantar fascia? Yeah. So um, in terms of the plantar fascia, the my my approach is generally to go to a uh, a non weight bearing status for at least three days. I do get these folks into a boot. Um, I do want to uh, offload that plantar fascia. Um, so, and then, and then I, I progress them as tolerated. Okay. And what about be, uh, can, can PRP injections um, be done with this asked about ACL repairs, um, which are, which are more, more commonly ACL reconstructions. Um, and, and there is in the, in the orthopedic world, there, they're, they are also looking at it, and, and they are also finding good, good results um, in utilizing PRP in different surgical uh, circumstances. One, one of the biggest things that is, is probably most challenging in, uh, when doing it in a surgical setting is, is determining when to inject it, because when you're doing arthroscopy, if you've ever been on the cases, there is a lot of water getting kind of flushed in and around through the joint. Um, and so ensuring that the PRP stays where it's supposed to be um, is, is going to be important when you're, when you're doing in the methodology. Okay. Have, I, should, I should start removing some of these. So I'm not, uh, okay. The, would, would an ortho referral be needed for PRP or do PCPs also perform these injections? So, so in regards to referrals, um, it, you know, it, th that's going to be a really good question for your local physicians. You, you can, you can probably like Google locally where, where, uh, who, who's doing PRP, um, as a, as a sports medicine physician, as a, as a non-operative, uh, orthopedist, we do it. Um, and, and insurance, insurance determines whether or not you need a referral um, more often than uh, whether, uh, so anyhow, um, so, so not, you don't necessarily need a referral. There may be uh, primary care physicians that are doing it. You generally do want it to be done under ultrasound guidance or some kind of image guidance. 
So I would consider that in your choice of who's going to be sticking a needle um, into wherever they are. Uh, so yes, and then now we have run out of time. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And please, if you have any questions, um, any additional questions that, that I wasn't able to get to because I know there was a lot on here, please do not hesitate to email us. That's journalclub at relevaysportsmedicine.com. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Have a good one.